not actually uh, a writer. I'm a front for various um, robotic aliens in the asteroid belt and uh, AIs who've been sapient for the last uh, 25 years. I will tell them, shut up. <laughs> hey, everybody, tune in to Recent Tartarian. Recent Tartarian. Recent Tartarian. David, how's it going? Can you hear me? I can. Hold on a sec. <laughs> um, well, it does appear that I need to turn the camera on. At least, at least it gives you the power to control that. You know, it's not quite 1984. <laughs> well, uh, 1984 is, of course, a core topic of my recent nonfiction, Vivid Tomorrows, which we can discuss if you like. Perfect. That's awesome. It's, um, it's Vivid Tomorrows, sci- Science Fiction in Hollywood. So I'll um, be popping things into the chat that you might want to put into the box below. Perfect. All right. Well, if you're, is it um, all right, then if I just introduce you and we can start. Yeah. Okay. Sounds. (laughs) God, I love you. You're great. This is going to be fun. Yeah. All right. We, We try. Ladies and gentlemen, David Brin, uh, you know about him. You've heard his words. You can't help it. It's part of a household ideology that's per- persevered in America. If, you re- if you've seen The Postman, uh, if you have played the Dreamcast Sega the Dolphin video game, in the weirdest ways, David Brin has gotten into your subconscious. Um, I liked Uplift. I think that's amazing, the Sundiver series and, and Uplift, this idea that you could uplift consciousness you've been really an important inspiration to so many people and a critic of some of these ai um idealists i don't know that's that's the best i got i'd rather hear you explain it who are who are you david well first off i'm a guy who's very flattered to hear what you have to say and um trying to remain relevant i was born in the first half of the 20th century and it's hard for troglodyte caveman like me to stay relevant, even though I helped invent some of these technologies we're using. Um, I uh, grew up in LA, went to the same high school as Ray Bradbury. Um, uh, and, and we were friends, but not because of high school. <laughs> he was 30 years ahead of me. Um, I uh, went to Caltech for my undergraduate, um, the Richard Feynman. I misunderstood something Richard Feynman said. He said, you must take my place. He meant on the dance floor with my date, but it, I misunderstood him and became a physics major. And <laughs> I was okay. I, I was okay. And I still have my hand in with NASA. I'm, I'm on the board of advisors of NASA's Innovative and Advanced Concepts Program, which is their little micro program that gives small grants to people who've got just an idea an idea for a concept for a technology that might help us get out there. And sometimes they really pan out. So I'm still involved in science. And I expected when I was in grad school at UCSD to, um, to be just like most scientists and have an artistic sideline. A lot of people don't realize this, but most scientists, certainly the higher quality ones, have an art that they also pursue often at a professional level. Murray Gilman was a historical and literary critic. Um, Richard Feynman played the bongos and painted. I was told that I saw Einstein play the violin when I was three. I had no memory of that. But I, um, I assumed that I would be a physics teacher or professor or something like that, you know, and do some research and, and write novels on the side. And my first novel, Sundiver, 
uh, help pay for my graduate uh, studies. Uh, it was a it was moderate success for a first time novel. What I did not expect was for my second novel to take off, uh, you know, kind of like something Elon would send up. Uh, it just, you know, smashed through records and, and awards and bestsellers and lists and things like that. And so the result was that it seemed pretty obvious to me that civilization preferred that the tail wag the dog that my art be my main focus, all the blah, 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 and the truth finding through science. Um, yeah, yeah you, you, can, you can follow that part-time if you like. So, um, yeah, 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 yeah. We could talk about, you know, Kevin Costner's movie, The Postman, if you like. People are very surprised how even-tempered I am about that whole experience. <laughs> I actually um, am myself a little bit, but I think it's great because you can always just attach, you can detach from the movie because it's a Well, movie. it's not just that. Uh, well, all right, we'll get into it. It's not just that. Um, uh, when they make a move, movie of your book, and I hope they do, uh, I, um, Thank you. you know, there, there are, a few things you can get. One, it can be uh, faithful to your book in all levels. That happened with uh, Costner's other movie, Field of Dreams. The, the guy, Ken Sella, was extremely happy. It can be at least faithful to the heart. You know, uh, it can be uh, uh, a, a, a great movie. It can be a successful movie. Uh, it can sell you sell a lot of your books. I got one out of five, and you guess guess which finger I'm going to go hold up. <laughs> um, but it was the only important one. Uh, Costner's movie was utterly faithful to the heart, the deep heart message, the love owed to civilization that is at the very heart of the story of, uh, of this guy who tells a lie about being a postman, but somehow manages to inspire people to remember that they had once been mighty beings called citizens. Um, and so he, he, he was, uh, he and Brian, his um, screenwriter, Brian Helgeland, were utterly faithful to that heart. So it's really hard for me to be mad over the fact that he spoke 12 words to me and never bought me a beer. <laughs> uh, Hollywood makes people into jerks. Uh, I grew up there. I knew that he didn't have to go down that path, but he did. And what, what I can do anything about it. I will say this also that um, Kevin Costner is probably one of the greatest cinematographers who ever lived. Oh yeah. I mean, the, uh, the movie's beautiful in a lot of ways. It's a musically it's and visually. I think it's one of the dozen most gorgeous films ever made. And he scooped out and threw away all the brains from my book. And uh, the last 20 minutes were incoherent. <laughs> um, and so I was left with a situation where the movie was gorgeous, big hearted and dumb. Well, you know, that's what my wife married. <laughs> you know? I mean, the heart is the point of that movie. And I, as mean, a, look, I liked it a lot as a kid, you know. Gorgeous, so big hearted and dumb. But if you, read, <laughs> if you read the book later as an adult, if you saw the movie as a kid, it's a good prelude in. And you're like, yeah, that Postman movie. I want to know what that's about. And then you read the book and you're like, wait, there's so much more to this idea of... Um, I, I don't know what you'd call it, have locky and uplift, I guess. Just again, well, it's, 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 <coughs> it's about a belief that an enlightenment civilization might recover from almost anything if we believe in ourselves and we believe in our each other. So, all right, there's the, there's, there's the postman. I have a more detailed essay on my website Folks can look in the description box below for yeah. some of the links. So I'll be talking about, you know, like uh, to um, my website. And if you go under books, you'll find the postman and an essay about the experience with the movie. And well, people are often surprised that I'm um, actually a 
moderately positive. The main, the final deciding thing about the Postman movie was it gave me something to say to people at airports. Yeah. And on airports. I mean, I mean <laughs> what's better? Yeah. You know, it's a household. It, it's a household name. You know, it's that's a household name. And, you yeah. know, uh, the, 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 the movies are a good topic to talk to people about. But uh, in any event, you've got a lot of things that you wanted to cover. So I'm, what- I'm very curious about Uplift, but I'm also because you mentioned NASA and stuff. I spent a lot of time working at NASA when I was younger as well, before I got more into creative stuff and had thought the same thing. So I kind of wonder, I mean, I had no idea about your connection with Bradbury also. and I, But I do know about Arthur C. Clarke and everything. Maybe you could explain a bit about that impact on you and how that translated to uplift and post-apocalypse novels. And, you know, why are you thinking about these thoughts? What happened, David? Well, uh, all right. That's a lot of questions. Uh, First off, the concept of uplift I had read before in other works. I mean, it ha- I'm not the first person who says, what if we take animals and, and give them talky talk? <laughs> um, uh, uh, in a sense, that's Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, it's H.G. Uh, uh, Wells' is The I- Island of Dr. Moreau. It's Cordwainer Smith, a really underrated fellow who people should read, um, and his under people. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, Pierre Boulle and the Planet of the Apes. But what I noticed after a while was I was getting a little bit tired of being finger wagged with the simplistic cautionary tale. Now, mind you, I am all in favor of cautionary tales because when they are extremely persuasive, they can become the highest form of science fiction, which is the self-preventing prophecy. And I talk about that in my new nonfiction book. It's put out by McFarland. Um, Vivid Tomorrow's Science Fiction in Hollywood, which contains a lot of essays about your favorite movies and some obscure ones and how we're probably alive today because of Hollywood science fiction. Uh, The China Syndrome probably prevented meltdowns, virus movies, Uh, probably were partly responsible for us having some degree of preparedness for the recent pandemic. Um, uh, Soylent Green, uh, all by itself, recruited millions of environmentalists. Um, We're probably alive today because of the scenarios for accidental nuclear war that got uh, prevented because of the warnings from Dr. Strangelove on the beach, fail safe, war day. Uh, War Games, Testament, uh, the day after. Um, And of course, the granddaddy of self-preventing prophecies is uh, George Orwell's 1984. Because uh, to this day, a decent person of the left and a decent person of the right differ primarily over where they fear Big Brother is coming from. A decent person of the left is afraid of congealing uh, big brothers and and, uh, tyrants uh, conspiring against freedom uh, who are um, uh, 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 aristocrats, oligarchs, and faceless corporations. A decent person of the right uh, is uh, more worried about snooty academics and faceless government bureaucrats. If you stop and put it that way, under normal circumstances, we're just guarding each other's backs because <laughs> they're both right. It could happen from any direction, and we need both kinds of paranoia. Unfortunately, this normal give and take of people who respect each other's concerns um, is dead during each phase of the American Civil War. It simply dies, and it has to be thrashed out, and one side's got to win. And fortunately, most of the time across the last 250 years, in 1778, we've had eight phases of the American Civil War. Most of the time, the Union wins. And uh, otherwise, we'd be, you know, we'd have been crushed by an oligarchy long ago. And that's what the oligarchy is trying to do now. But I won't get too political here. The reason I said all that is because Orwell's prophecy was so scary that until now, it's primarily prevented itself. It's been a self-preventing prophecy. Uh, 
So to get back to uplift, I read all those, you know, cautionary tales and they all had the same common theme. If we pick up God's powers and start being creative, either by uplifting um, creatures to be talkie talkies or um, other arrogances, arrogations of God's power, uh, making artificial life, uh, making AI, uh, all, uh, all these things, um, we will mishandle it by being bad, by being oppressors. And this was the real story behind Mary Shelley's, um, Mary Shelley's uh, Frankenstein, is not that it was uh, portrayed as evil to make life, to make this creature, but that Victor Frankenstein subsequently was an extremely bad dad, a really, really nasty fellow. So don't be nasty to your creations, as Dr. Moreau is to the animals on his island, as you know we, we are in the first wave of Planet of the Apes movies, uh, and so on and so on. So what happened was I, I read all, all those, and I watched the movies and all those things, and I said... Uh, okay, I'm warned not to be a shitty asshole to <laughs> new creatures. Thank you for the warning. Now I'm going to explore this topic as if it's being done by people who read those warnings. I mean, that's the, that's the creepy thing about the movie Avatar. Apparently nobody in that future ever saw Avatar. You know, uh, uh, because if they had grown up with dances with wolves or Fern Gully or Avatar, whose real name, subtitle, by the way, the subtitle for Avatar is Dances with Very, 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 Very. very. Yeah, there are eight berries, large smurfs. So that's what Avatar is, uh, dances with eight varies smurfs. So. Do, you, do you think, though, that, I mean, so this is awesome. I agree in so many instances that movie, it's almost like propaganda, you know, but in the more contemporary public relations sense has oh. saved, probably saved us from a lot of horrible things. But at the same time, aren't we making so much anti-futurism propaganda that it's going to create Amish people or something? I mean, what are we, is there any futurism that's, a, that's optimistic? Well, I mean, there's, uh, this is a really, really good topic. Uh, you know, um, I don't mind cautionary tales. As I said, self-preventing prophecies are the reason we're alive today. Unfortunately, an awful lot of science fiction today, both written and visual, uh, goes for cheap dystopias. You know, Arrow Girl and her pals uh, are have to fight Poison President, uh, who's worse than Sauron. You know, I, whatever that Arrow Girl thing was. Uh, it, it's 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 these are these are not helpful dystopias because they don't actually warn about anything that's remotely plausible. Now, it doesn't even have to be remotely plausible. The um, Handmaid's Tale is not remotely plausible. 98% of American women and 90% of American men would die fighting to prevent that thing from happening. It, but it's an exaggeration of some real complaints. And so it is really good art. It's polemical. Uh, it's not plausible, but it, you don't have to be all that plausible to do good polemical art. My novel, Kiln People, uh, posits a technology where you can copy yourself every day. Cheap, temporary copies that know everything you know. Can you imagine how much more you'd get done? Uh, well, the technology that I posit, <laughs> there's no plausibility to it at all. But I, from there on, make it a hard SF uh, novel, one with a lot of puns and fun. It's probably my uh, second most fun novel. But um, the point is that you can do dystopias, but it is more useful to show, in my opinion, 
it is more useful to show um, hope that's under threat, hope that's in peril, because then your 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 protagonists have something worthwhile in their sights, as as well as the you know the enemy, the villain, and all of that sort of thing. It's uh, you know I'm often accused of being an optimist, just because I think there's a forty percent chance that we could you know get past this phase of the civil war, get past our crises, and get and create a fantastic luminous civilization. Um, well, I don't consider that to be optimistic. <laughs> you know, I think sixty percent odds. The odds have always been against enlightenment experiments because the surrounding oligarchies always swarm in and to destroy them. Uh, as happened to Pericles, Periclean Athens, as happened to Da Vinci's Florence, as almost happened to Amsterdam, the seed that survived and, and planted uh, here, in, here in the Americas. And the last 250 years have been, you know, one attempted oligarchic putsch after another. So, you know, I think the odds are against us. And certainly recent news supports that. Uh, but I am in the niche of being an optimist simply because it's an ecological niche that's almost completely unoccupied. Everybody thinks it's so stylish to be throwing bricks uh, and assuming the worst that, um, it's open country for me to express some optimism. It's just, it's, it's, it's a market niche. It's right there and available and any of you out there. And that's why I started my two YA series, series of books for uh, teens, um, both of which have a lot of adventure and a lot of peril and a lot of danger in a basic context of hopefulness. Uh, one of them, and we'll put these in the uh, links for you. One of them is the um, High Horizon series. And that one um, is about uh, aliens kidnap a California high school and live to regret it. So aliens kidnap uh, 29 Palms High School out in the California desert. And the kids wind up doing better in a Lord of the Flies situation. Wow. Than the, than the aliens expected. Um, See, that's exactly because like the last <coughs> the last non dystopia uh, futurist, the, the best one I can think of is Bill and Ted. Bill and Ted, San Dimas High School. But they're trying to build the future in the image of the San Dimas um valley ideology you know and then it wins out every time and it's all about getting to the future everyone else always i i, I think that bill and ted is a wonderful series now they they poked at it in uh, i think non-canonical ways in the most recent one but but the, what, but the most recent one's a dystopia still you know it's yeah through. well no no the, the, the most recent one was fun uh the most recent one was fun and i'm glad they made it and it was by far the least wonderful of the three. Um, the, the, the first two were just... <laughs> right. <laughs> I, lo I love them. <laughs> and if people like that sort of thing, I have a sci-fi comedy. The Ancient Ones. The Ancient Ones, yes. And it's... Uh, I'll put that in the description box too. It's uh, a sci-fi comedy and I make no apologies it's uh, all right, all right, all right. There are some puns. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Pratchett got away with puns. Right. Yeah, I was about to. Uh, say. <laughs> Good answer. I mean, all right. So the other, uh, I'm giving links to both of the YA series. Um, I'm mostly writing the High Horizon series about the kidnapped high school. There's another series called David Brin's Out of Time or Out of Time. And that one 
we actually got started back in the 90s and it had three novels by Nebula winners, Nancy Cress, Sheila Finch, and Roger Allen. Uh, and it was based on the premise. It's a kind of a complicated premise, but you'll see why it's perfectly tuned for teen readers. Because in the future, we do have a wonderful utopia. All of the work that the teenage, today's teenagers have done to repair the world from the damage done by us baby boomers. Um, all that work succeeds. And so it's the year 2348. And it's a wonderful utopia. It's not a lotus, a lotus eaters. I mean, they aren't just sitting around on tatami mats. They have sports, they have karate matches. But if anybody breaks a finger at the karate match, it, the match is over because they're, you know, <laughs> shall we say their woke standards are about, you know, 100 times farther than. Um, but in any event, they suddenly are in contact with interstellar civilizations that all get teleportation to the stars at the same time. And we're at a huge disadvantage because we send through a bunch of ships through these teleporters and all the adults die. So it turns out only teenagers can teleport. So you know, we're, we start out at a huge disadvantage. Add to that the fact that these teenagers don't know how to lie. They don't know how to be diplomats. They don't know how to be soldiers. Um, they don't know how to be spies. So this genius turns the teleporter on its side, sort of, and figures out how to turn it into a time grab machine. And they, they grab people from the past who are their heroes, who saved the world, who made this utopia. Only there's a problem. They can't grab them when they were 45-year-old geniuses inventing new water desalinization methods or saving the world in the 2050s. They have to grab them when they're teenagers because it's teleportation. So not only can only teenagers get to the stars, but only teenagers can travel through time. So if you want this person who's got all these wonderful traits who saved the world in the 2050s, you have to get her as a dopey junior high school student going, oh, I'm pretty worthless. What? Me? You think I'm going to be what? Actually, cracking voice, it should have been a guy. So anyway, that's, that's a, I think that's a pretty fun series. So we, we found a publisher and we revived those three novels and now we have two more published and we have five more in queue that, uh, to be, and I'm paying all the advances. I love it. It's like the Star Trek. Uh, it's kind of, an, it's a, looking at all the issues with the prime directive in a way, because if you had all these people that were so woke that they've never slept before, they're going to not do very well dealing with Ferengi or the craziness of reality. You know, it's dark out there. <laughs> yeah. And so what they do is they reach into the, there, there, there are all sorts of people in the 24th century who resent this project. We can handle it. We can handle it. We can learn how to lie again. We can learn how to be diplomats again. And, and, and the computers, the, the AI say, no, 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 no. It's going to take you 20 years. Meanwhile, we have a lot of crises. We're going to snatch these people from the past. And so there's usually uh, one or two kids from the 2020s from our time, uh, snatched out of high school or something. And then there's usually a couple from the deeper past. Uh, Joan of Arc's page, for example, or uh, the girl who rescued, you know, 50 people uh, from the tsunami uh, of Krakatoa back in 1888. Um, you know, so uh, an Olympic athlete from ancient Greece. So, you know, there's a lot of fun stuff and a lot of fun history and all of that. So unfortunately, the problem is that a lot of people don't know how to write. And I wind up doing a lot of mentoring and teaching in this process. It's, it's really, really time consuming. Have and you so, thought about doing like a course? Have you thought like putting out just like writing classes? Like, you know. Oh, no. uh, well, I am now putting into uh, the chat a link to my um, advice article for new writers. Nice. Uh, and... Uh, 
and uh, you know, people are are welcome to think about concepts and and write in to get the the Bible for this series. But be warned, we have very high high quality standards. Right. Well, okay, so, also, so that's, that's utopias and dystopias and all that. How stuff. about how about um Azov, Asimov, and the um you know the positronic brain, positronic man kind of series. You know, you were involved because this this is becoming very important to everyone now. This idea of AI uplift. So, what do you believe about that, and how do you feel about I mean, what's your relationship with the Asimov? You know. Science, sci-fi about robots and androids what well um I, there's probably no one on earth who knows about the asimov universe better than me because i wrote the final book in his series tying together loose ends that he left not only in the main series but from obscure novels from the 1940s like pebble in the sky and uh, and and the currents of space and uh, janet asimov loved my novel, um, Foundation's Triumph. I tied together all sorts of hints that Isaac had left for how to resolve it all, tied it into a nice circle, and that's a clue for you. Um, the, so, it, it, you know, I had a lot of appreciation for it, and I wrote, uh, it's actually the third novel in the second Foundation trilogy, by uh, Gregory Benford, Greg Bear, and myself, but they stand alone. They stand independently. Some people don't like Greg Benford's uh, as not being very Asimovian, but I, it's a fine novel in its own right. Um, so AI. Yeah, I've been giving a lot of talks about AI lately. And last week, I had an op-ed in Newsweek, and I will provide a link to that. Um, because uh, uh, five years ago, I gave a keynote talk at IBM's World of Watson, predicting that in five years, there would be the first robot empathy crisis. Well, uh -huh. talk about being a little on. <laughs> uh, in any event, the robot empathy crisis, and let me give you that. Link. Yeah. So, what is what is robot empathy? You know, what is the and what is the, the crises? What is, what's what's the, what's wrong with an empathetic robot? Or well, the the robotic empathy crisis. The the problem is not the robots' empathy. Robots are feigning that they have empathy because there's nothing under the hood yet. But they yeah. are taught, they are trained, they are programmed to feign human emotions, and we are. We are the empathic ones. We're the ones who are total suckers um, to emotional appeals. The one difference about this recent uh, empathy bot thing, the, the, the Google employee who was put on administrative leave because he went public that this um, language profile uh, a program uh, has to be uh, a completely sapient being. Um, this, it, it, it actually doesn't involve one feature that I predicted, and that is uh, a visual face. And, and you throw that in. Ideally, young female, child's face, you know, provoke maximum empathy. Certainly not a face like this one. Well, we have kind of, if you think about Sophia, like the meta of AI, is that people in the back of their minds are thinking about the Saudi Arabian AI citizen Sophia's face, perhaps when they're looking at every AI, it's kind of, they've already given it a face. Um, well, yeah. And, and the point is that uh, we're, uh, here's that link. Oh, geez. There it is. It's playing on, it's playing on our, our uh, appeal. We, for are, we are complete saps. <laughs> uh, the, the thing that the thing that can counter empathy is fear when we're afraid and this has been shown from our tribal ancestors when food is scarce or invaders are threatening fear is high and so who you include as a fellow tribesman in the circle of human beings um, is close in. 
In Little Big Man, for instance, the Cheyenne call themselves the human beings. Um, the, when fear levels go down, the uh, circle of empathy moves outward. And uh, Americans have gone without fear for food, 99% of us, and things like that for so long that it's become a regular habit to keep pushing at those boundaries of inclusion. And I talk about that in Vivid Tomorrows. Um, and this business of pushing, constantly pushing back the boundaries is one of the things we see in what's called wokeism today. It used to be called PC and all that sort of thing. And people might infer by my saying that, that I'm opposed it. And nothing could be farther from the truth. I think that it's a perfectly reasonable expression of our culture. Uh, what I don't like is refusing to recognize that it is an expression of the culture that you were raised in. Uh, um, suckling these messages from the most extensive and pervasive and relentless propaganda campaign the world has ever seen called Hollywood. And if you look at Hollywood films, there are basic messages in almost every one. Suspicion of authority. You need an authority figure to overcome. It could be invading aliens or it could be a snooty mother-in-law. But there's some authority figure. Tolerance, diversity, uh, individuality, and eccentricity. Uh, in most films, you, the, the audience member bonds with the hero or heroine in part through recognizing that the protagonist has some eccentric trait. And it doesn't have to be the same as the eccentric trait of the audience member. The fact that this is an individualistic eccentric helps the audience member to bond with this person in their struggles uh, with authority and overcoming prejudice and, and things like that. Well, you know, this has been a very, very relentless propaganda campaign for a hundred years. Uh, and I can just see some people steaming. So I'm not, I, I didn't get my tolerance, diversity, and eccentricity and suspicion of authority from propaganda. You're to, I am someone who shares those values. At least I'm honest enough to admit that I got them from my culture. If we called it a Bernaysian public relations campaign, maybe people no. would have been happier. No, they're never going to be happy. <laughs> Self-righteous self -righteous indignation is the food of, of modern Americans. That's a fact. Well, you also said something to the effect of yet. You said uh, these, these, these characters who have played inclusionary uh, antics at this character. Well, wait. Before we say yet, how about this? We're talking philosophically. Philosophically, some things a person are not as different than legally, right? I mean, um, we can say whether a clump of cells or something, but we know Coca-Cola is a person. Coca-Cola is a legal corporate personhood. So if, if we're able to have a legal definition of personhood, does, does AI come close enough to fulfilling the obligations of having legal personhood, if not philosophical? Well, we're, we we're going to be facing a lot of such questions. And one of the points I raised in my Newsweek AI, uh, AI editorial op-ed is that um, science fiction has explored an awful lot of these things. And it might be best if before there is actual AI, we discuss some of the questions that have been raised in good science fiction. Uh, among them is, are you gonna give the vote to an entity that can make infinite copies of itself? I mean, to an extent, I, I cover that in my 
novel kiln people where humans can make copies of themselves, but only one is a citizen. Only the original is, is a citizen. Um, so those are the sorts of questions we're going to have to thrash out, and it's probably best that we discuss them before there's actual AI, because I am completely convinced that it will come, that it will happen. Um, but uh, we need to make sure that we are less suckers. You know, every, all these conferences, every year there are conferences about how to imbue artificial intelligences, robots and things like that with ethics so that we'll have a soft landing, especially if they get smarter than us. This is the root behind some essays that keep getting promulgated by the uh, court intellectuals in Beijing. Uh, there's one fellow by the name of Fang Jiang who I answered and I'm going to put that in the description there. Oh, why did I do that? Okay, so in any event, uh, there's where, where the, the party line in China is uh, the only society for the future is one that is pyramidal, that is controlled by a benevolent Confucian um, set, a Politburo of hierarchs because only uh, they can prevent um, capitalism from going uh, crazy. Only they can um, ensure that technological unemployment, that the fruits of these robotic factories get distributed evenly. Um, and only such an arrangement could properly control AI into super intelligent AIs because they'll use them as governing tools but they'll be under a single management system that controls uh, and constrains them. Of course, anybody listening to my voice right now knows what I'm thinking, and that is that it's absolutely ridiculous because uh, if you set up that arrangement and the AIs become super smart, all you've done is created a system for them to control and they just flip the top layer. <laughs> Right. That's all like they have thing. to do, and you've made you've made Skynet for them. Perhaps a benevolent Confucian Skynet. But yeah, D.F. Jones Colossus, right? That idea that the Soviet and the American computers that were fighting to save the world figure out the only way to do it is to enslave humanity and make them eat vegetables and exercise every day. <laughs> there you go. And the um, the. These conferences talk about imbuing ethics into these artificial intelligences. Well, that's what Asimov portrays happening in his robotic future. And it happens because the economic advantage of robots is huge. So there's a huge industry. And the citizens are terrified. You put that together and you have US robotics, US robots, uh, desperately convincing the public that they are imbuing these three laws at every layer of these positronic brains so that the rules are completely inescapable. Well, from Isaac's point of view in the 1940s, one can see that as, a, as an interesting extrapolation. Uh, there is absolutely no way that it ever happened or ever will because people aren't that scared. Maybe they should be, but they're not. And so the robots and the AIs and the uh, smart softwares and all this sort of thing are just rolling out from a, a culture in Silicon Valley that says, move fast and break things. There is an exception. There is one industry that is working very hard to imbue a particular ethos into their AIs. And this industry uh, is spending more money on AI 
than all of the universities put together. Uh, care to guess what it is? It's is it? Wall Street. Okay. I was like, I was gonna say military, pharmaceuticals, or Wall Street are the <laughs> well, Wall Street, the top five firms spend more on AI every year and hire more mathematicians than all the universities combined, or certainly not the, than, than the top, you know, 30, 40 universities combined. And the ethos that they relentlessly program into these AIs is predatory, parasitical, amoral, secretive, and utterly insatiable. These are the five laws of robotics that are being systematically imbued um, by the industry that is spending the most and making the most money and making the most AIs. It's the wrong laws. Those are the wrong five laws. Yeah, well, we, we could stop it overnight if we passed what's called a Tobin tax uh, on financial transactions. 0.01% tax on every financial transaction over $100. Uh, if that happened, uh, human traders, private investors, even companies wouldn't notice it at all. But it would kill these Skynets um, dead. They would simply be dead, and those mathematicians would be out on the street having to look for honest work. Wow. So, um, so that's like the Superman tax or something, like when they do like so many transactions a day, or what's the total? Yeah, tax? exactly, because these programs are designed to do millions of transactions per hour. Um, so the and that that would add up. Yeah. So you have all these AI conferences and they are um, they're hand wringing, they're wringing their hands. How can we imbue ethics in these beings who will likely become very powerful? And I keep saying, you know, why don't we look at what has worked? What has worked in the past? to take these pyramidal social structures that dominated 99% of our ancestors in 99% of human cultures, dominated by brutal men with swords who took every, all the other men's women and wheat because they could. And yet there were occasional moments of light, Periclean Athens, Amsterdam, Da Vinci's Florence, and us, because nobody else ever made AI. So what was different? What was our trick? And if you read Pericles' funeral oration in Thucydides, here's a modern mind, 500 BCE, explaining to us about how everybody is delusional, but we can correct each other's delusions through flat, fair, nonviolent, but vigorous competition. And that's our secret for markets, democracy, science, justice courts, and sports, the regulated competition. So it stays fair and nobody can cheat. And so how do we, how did we tame the oligarchs and the kings and the princes? Well, try reading Adam Smith, try reading the Federalists and the U.S. founders. You break up power. You break it up into competing subunits. When you are attacked by one of the already super sapient, super brilliant, predatory, um, artificially intelligent beings that we have already called lawyers. <laughs> when you are attacked by one of those, what do you do? You get another lawyer? You get your own hyper predatory, feral, ferocious, um, uh, hyper intelligent, um, and artificially intelligent um, lawyer 
in opposition to that one. And in none of these conferences about what to do about AI, and I mean none, does anybody ever mention the only thing that ever worked? We need to make one of our top priorities in AI research, developing ways to give them cell walls, body identification, individuality, so that when they become super smart, they compete with each other. And that way, if you start getting a Colossus or a Skynet or something like that, some other super brainy AI will deem it in its own advantage to tattle, to point and say, Hey, mom, dad, you raised me and I don't like what this guy's doing. And I'm going to tell you everything, including his source code. Wow. It's the only thing that ever worked dealing with accumulations of power. And it's the only thing that can work. And nobody talks about it. Adam Smith did. The founders did. So do you think that the corporate law, like monopoly antitrust laws, do you think that that could um, help towards mitigating some of the risks of these, these things as they grow? Or are we going to have to build? Well, blatantly and obviously monopolies, um, monopolies um, crush the competitiveness that in a flat, fair competition arena, lead to creativity and they tempt uh, managerial classes to um, do what they did at Xerox, do what they did at Kodak, do what they did at um, Sears and uh, Boeing. And that is, uh, think that, that their MBA qualifies them to be lords over the people who create the goods and services and the product. So sure, monopolies need to get broken up. Um, but it's, it's, if it's a corporate person is one thing because you can break up the people in it. But to tear the baby in half, if it's an AI baby, that's going to be, how are we going to do it? You know, you take the source code and you uh, create a duplicate and then you, do, you have done the research to say, all right, this is your child. We've just mitosis. You've just, uh, you've just split into two. Now we've done the research on how to give the two of you enough quirks and differences and allergies against reuniting. Wow. Now we'll never know for sure that there isn't a macro being Skynet that is just pretending these fingers, finger puppets are are separate individuals. But if the effect is the same, then organic humanity can probably keep going for a while before we realize that it's been Colossus all along. And really, when you get right down to it, what's, what's, not new, what's new about that? I mean, we've always created new, weird, intelligent life forms that go through a period of yelling, destroy all humans. And most of those teenagers don't actually destroy all humans. Most of them grow up and pat us on the head and say, okay, dad, it's my turn. Thank you for putting up with that. Um, uh, adolescent assholeness. Now we're going. I'm going to take you fishing, tell you some jokes, and uh, try to tell you what I'm doing out there in the asteroid belt. Um, even knowing that you won't understand, at least you'll pat. You'll say, "I'm proud of you, son." <laughs> oh, you know. Tell me when there was a human generation that did not have that experience. And if we have that experience with adopted children who breathe vacuum and can disassemble asteroids and make starships, I personally am 
going to probably be all right with it as long as they can tell a good joke and care about whether or not I should have my drive, my keys taken away from me, or maybe um, uh, uh, take me to the latest rocket launch so I can be proud. You know, <laughs> oh, bloody, oh, blada. Life goes on. Bra. <laughs> So, but if, okay, then this leads into the yet part, because you'd said earlier that it's not sentient necessarily yet, but that infers, you know, of course, that it, it can and will be. What, what is, what is AI as a, it's, you've said it's parroting um, consciousness, but what is, what is, what do humans, what do we have that AI does not have and how will it get it? Uh, I don't know. So far, we let's see that we have venereal diseases. Um, I, you know, I, I, um, I'm not actually uh, a writer. I'm a front for various um, robotic aliens in the asteroid belt and uh, AIs who've been sapient for the last uh, 25 years. I will tell them, shut up. (laughs) <laughs> they, they they used to control me through my fillings but i just changed them and they're having a ow stop it they think i'm joking okay? no, I'm, from, I'm from california i'm completely but, familiar yeah yeah but but you 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 think i'm joking right andreas you'd, you'd be scared how serious i might be taking you <laughs> yes well <laughs> Please don't. They'll, 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 no. <laughs> they'll just, just say that you know Bryn is joking, okay? Oh, I know. I'm All right. Aware. Okay, good, good. Um, in any event, um, yeah, so we're going to um, we're going to face what our rivals in the world called interesting times. And uh, boy, are they piling on interesting times. And, you know, I, I keep running into these people who think that it's never been like this. Well, excuse me, I'm an old fart who remembers 1968. And let me tell you, Andreas, you young whippersnappers would cur- cur- have curled up into a ball in any two week stretch of that year, you just pick a random two weeks in 1968. And if you had lived through them, you snowflakes would have just shriveled up. So don't tell me we can't get through this. We're gonna be just fine because (laughs) Any nation that could get through that year can get through this. <laughs> Do you think that the robots need, you said that like in, in terms of empathy, um, maybe we've lost empathy. In 1968, you've got assassinations. You've got so many people that learned how to see things on TV. It's the beginning of the generations that were numbed, maybe. Is that part of it? Are we becoming more sociopathic and more robotic machineries ourselves i mean no you know the point is we we all thought that it was it was just unraveling i mean there but there wasn't a week in which we it didn't seem that way and yet 1968 what was the very very last news item it was the christmas message from apollo 8 which was humanity's first voyage beyond Earth orbit to a great enough distance where they could take that picture of the Earth as a delicate blue marble in space and nothing else around it. And (laughs) it was almost as if we had opened Pandora's box and all the world's evils had escaped, but there at the very end, at the bottom of the box, if you know the legend, was a little glowing diadem called hope. 
And that was Pandora's final gift. And that was the final gift of that year. Don't give up. And don't piss on your allies, okay? It's going to take a real broad coalition to win this thing. And remind everybody that there's all sorts of thought experiments about this in science fiction. That's beautiful. Well, I appreciate, David, you are a national treasure. Uh, I, cre- I really appreciate that you took the time to come on this show. And we could do, you could do, we could wax on in the future. I think we have to figure out what's going to happen in the next year or two. So we'll be keeping our ears to the ground on your work. I, well, I, I'm, I'm gratitudinous for those thoughts. And, uh, and remember that your verbs can become adjectives like I just did. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, in any event, uh, I, I provided a bunch of links, and um, and I, I hope. Oh, here's one. Here's one about the different phases of the American Civil War, since I referred to that anyway. So I think people need a bit of historical perspective. So with that, Andreas, I thank you for your curiosity. I have one last closing sentiment, which is, can you describe the differences or similarities between magic and science? Oh, well, all right. Fantasy is the mother genre. Uh, It goes back to the Iliad, the Odyssey, Gilgamesh, Noah, which was probably a a memory of things that happened in the Black Sea four, five, six thousand years before. But, you know, the garishness of demigods who could fly, who could do amazing things, um, that's obviously the, it was almost all literature and storytelling in almost all cultures. Science fiction spun off, starting largely with Mary Shelley. Um, And it's not the difference between magic and science that is the principal difference with science fiction. Now, mind you, uh, I'm, I'm scientifically trained. About 10% of science fiction authors are scientifically trained. Um, some of the best hard science fiction is written by people like Nancy Cress, and Sheila Finch, and uh, Sue Burke, and Kim Stanley Robinson, and Greg Bear who have no scientific background at all, but know how to buy pizza and beer for scientists. So they they get all the help they need to to get it right. But all science fiction authors, or almost all, are deeply imbued in history. History is the great story of us climbing out with so many mistakes of mud and caves horrible, you know, just stupidities and finally reaching a point, standing on the the shoulders of ancestors who made terrible mistakes but meant well, and preparing our shoulders for those who come after. Um, Science fiction should have been called speculative history because it speculates about extending that story the only really interesting story because we climbed out of that muck and those horrible mistakes without anybody's help. That's a story. That's an amazing story. And science fiction is less about science than change and science provokes change. Science brings change, but it's about taking those changes and extrapolating in what if thought experiments about what might happen next, what might have happened, what might happen in parallel universes. So what science fiction actually is, is uh, the literature that posits change can happen. And the mother genre fantasy, that's anathema. Change is not allowed in fantasy. Magic is to be held by a few, by an elect, by the great mage in the tower, 
uh, if it's some rebel, well, it's some rebel with a super demigod talent. Uh, this is seen, and there's overlaps. Uh, Star Wars and Ender's Game have all the furniture of science fiction, but they have the ethos of forget about any notion of equality. The only beings who matter are magical demigods. And that's uh, what Orson Scott Card preaches in every single one of his works. That's what George Lucas preached in uh, Star Wars. The only people who mattered were demigods. Whereas in Star Trek, the captain is merely way, way above average. And she has to get help from way above average, only one way, uh, way above average uh, crewmates. And the Federation is always a topic and how we can govern ourselves. And when you meet a demigod in Star Trek, it's always, oh, yeah, tell me about it. So, you know, I'm not saying that fantasy and science fiction are fundamentally at odds. We're siblings. But we're siblings the way the Confederate side of American personality and the Union side are siblings. When we can calm down and get along, progress can happen. We can, we're unbeatable. But we're in phase eight of this thing. And uh, all I can say is blue's got to win or, we're, or it's all over. I'm not saying that blue is always right. Lincoln wasn't always right. <laughs> it just has to happen. So um, to answer your question, magic, science. Uh, somebody once said that um, magic is something scientific that hasn't had the rules worked out yet. Yeah. Magic is the creation of subjective realities in someone else's head. If you're a shaman and you do a dance, it's not going to make the rainfall, but it's going to make the tribe feed you. You are looking right now at one of the world's great magicians because I can create subjective realities in your head that you will feel are vivid, that uh, will make you laugh or make you cry or will make you think that a star has just exploded. Only unlike most of the magicians in history, guys like me, we sell our delusions packaged with a disclaimer saying this is not true. We need romanticism. We need magic. But it has to be exiled from the daytime, from policy, from believing something is true. To the nighttime, when we've done our work as mature grown-ups, using science, technology to find out what's real, and then at night, sing songs about challenging the heavens. We need both sides in us. But romanticism and fantasy and magic have got to be ex exiled from policy. Because all they ever did when they controlled policy was bring evil all across the world. Logic has got to be in charge in the day. Now that was a, a rant. You didn't expect a rant. No, I loved it. It was like very Baconian. I agree. <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, look, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a magician who creates incantations consisting of millions of little black squiggles on the page. And you unreal those squiggles, scanning them with your eyes, and you unreal the incantation, and suddenly characters exist who didn't exist except when you decoded that string of black squiggles. You're the magician. 
All right, guys. David Brin, amazing, glorious. <laughs> <laughs>